about a year ago, we featured Dan Snow, one of the founding members of the Stone Trust on Nature Revisited. Since then, I have been wanting to revisit the Stone Trust in Dummerston, Vermont, to learn more about the work they are doing to preserve, instruct, and promote the art and function of dry stone walling, more recently referred to by some as dry stone construction. This spring, I visited the Stone Trust for three of their workshops, talking with faculty, instructors, and students about the important work being done there and to see firsthand the instructions and the process that goes into this very ancient art form and to learn more about the goals and the future of Stone and the Stone Trust. My name is Stefan Van Norden and this is Nature Revisited. That lunky hole in the wall there is a special feature, but it has a functional origin, which is a pass-through for small livestock um, that can be quickly opened and closed uh, with just a couple of rocks, you know, you stuff some stones in there. In terms of their origins, a lot of these things were pretty humble. It's like, okay, how do you build a good corner? How do you build a, an, an easy pass-through for a sheepdog or for some sheep? and they wouldn't necessarily have looked anything like any of these. They would have been rough and ready. So this is taking yeah. it to another level and making it almost perfect. Sure. My name is Michael Weitzner. I'm one of the members, one of the founding members. I could tell the story sort of from the beginning. In the late 90s and early 2000s, along with a colleague uh, named Dan Snow and others, we were running workshops in an organic sort of way. We just, let's invite people to share the, the craft and encourage people to get involved. One day, a young man named Jared Flynn showed up, got involved and took a workshop with us and had this idea that maybe what we needed was a purpose-built space. That was the beginning of the Stone Trust. We wanted to share the craft with other people and encourage people to uh, get involved in dry stone walling and learn how to do it to a certain standard. And of course, at that point, uh, the only standard that we were familiar with was the one that we'd been exposed to, which happens to be the approach taken by the Dry Stone Walling Association of Great Britain. What is the Stone Trust mission? The Stone Trust mission is to preserve and advance the art and craft of dry stone walling. And I think that's a very strong statement. And over the last year and a half, it has become very clear to me that a mission statement is important. And it's really, what is the vision? Why does that mission matter? So that mission matters because it matters to people in many, many places in North America that the stone heritage that exists in the local landscape is preserved. And so one of the things we do is we teach people how to do that. It also matters because stone is obviously a durable, sustainable material that can play a significant role in the contemporary landscape. And so it's important that people understand how to build with dry stone if we're going to really incorporate stonework into our contemporary infrastructure. The last reason that that mission is important is because you cannot preserve a craft if you don't have people who do the work and who do the work in a way that provides them and their families and their communities with an economic base. And so one of the aspects of the work that we do is to help people who intend to earn their livelihood through dry stone walling 
learn how to do that in a way that is economically viable for themselves. I'm Amy Louise Pfeffer. I'm the executive director of the Stone Trust since October of 2019. What would you say to someone that might be listening who's interested in stone? What might you want to relate to them in their process of why they might want to come to the Stone Trust? They have some connection to stone, and very often it is a deeply felt sense of the mystery of stone, the ancientness of stone. And that's kind of an evanescent sense, but m many, many people are coming because they have stone built where they are and they want to work with it and they don't know how. So we have a curriculum in dry stone and the curriculum derives from the Dry Stone Walling Association of Great Britain. We have articulated that curriculum to suit the purposes and needs here where we live and we teach. People come in and take an introductory course. The introductory workshop has now four formats. We have a one-day introduction, we have a two-day introduction, we have a women's two-day introduction for the first time in 2021, and we have a contractor's introduction. You really need to take an introductory workshop because it teaches you the five basic principles of how to build a dry stone wall. It teaches you what you need to know to make sure that that wall will stand up for ever, or at least for a very long time. I definitely feel that stone and stone walls convey the sense of the sacred. And you can see that in cathedrals. You can see that in the stone structures built by indigenous people. And you can feel that when you go to the Stone Trust Center in Dummerston, Vermont. People call me up and people email me and they say thank you and they say I took my children there. And I think it's also important to point out that there is something sacred in the knowing how and in the learning to know how. And I have the privilege of interacting with the handful of master craftsmen in North America. You can feel the presence of stone in their presence. And you can feel a peaceful connectedness. Is it okay to set your foundation stones first on the wall side and work out? Like kind of what you were saying yesterday, so you have that one or two inch tolerance of that you might want to move your, the, the start of your cheek end in or out. So. Well, it's difficult to conceive of something uh, more primitively elemental than rock uh, on the surface of our planet. Rock and air and water. So handling rock is something that goes very deep into our heritage from a genetic standpoint, if you want to think of it that way. So what better way to connect with, uh, with our genetic heritage than uh, to be engaged in handling material that is eons old. And the handling piece is where it's thought that we came from. Uh, using our hands and our brains is, is what makes us human to a large extent. Now you see how these stones are long into the wall? They're long into the wall. And ideally, they would be perfect if they were zippered in like that. And then this is where we're gonna talk about the harding, the harding part. Don't put little bitty stuff in. It's tempting to put gravel in. It's very tempting. But gravel is the death of your wall. And you've heard me say that before. And the reasons of why. It will get I'm Rachel place. Peters. I'm coming from Portland, Maine, most recently. I'm a landscaper. It's hard to hire people with this, with this kind of skill. 
So when I saw that this was offered, it just made sense um, to get that to get that education for myself, so I could hire people better. So you're taking the skills that you learn here and applying it to a professional. Yeah, yeah, and and in my personal life too. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's it's such basic common sense information on one hand that when you read about it or you watch a video it feels like anybody could do it but once you get hands-on with it it's it's really challenging um, it's a lot of fun i think the desire for stone walls is is huge um, the demand for it is huge but uh, people give up on trying to find somebody who can do it for them My name is Brian Post. I'm currently the Director of Education and Training here at the Stone Trust. Can you describe dry stall walling for people who aren't familiar sure. with it? Sure. So um, dry stone refers to no mortar. So wet mortared work, you know, mortar is wet when it's applied. So mortared work is called wet masonry. And dry masonry or dry stone work is done without mortar. It's just relying on the friction and the um, the gravity and the friction of the stones to hold in the structure. Walling is a traditional craft, really dating back to walls used for agricultural purposes, for field fences primarily, but also uh, retaining walls and other type of structures. Uh, in modern stonework, you could almost replace the word with construction, dry stone construction, because so much of what we do really is about landscape construction or other types of projects, you know, everything from a bridge abutment to perhaps a, you know, a barn foundation, retaining walls. You know, we're doing very little, at least here in, in Vermont, not much in terms of agricultural fences anymore. It's much more about building structures that are used using the traditional dry stone techniques. You know, the students at the Stone Trust coming away should come away with good understanding of the structural fundamentals of, of dry stone work that is strong and that will last. They'll also have a really good sense of what good structural quality stonework looks like. So most of the, you know, I hear this time and again from previous students, you know, they never look at a stone wall the same again. And all, you know, so many of the, the projects that they thought before looked like beautiful stone walls, they now think, oh, that's terrible, it's gonna fall down soon. So they're coming away with, with a knowledge of, of what good work stonework should look like and the basics of how to do it. And then as they get into more advanced workshops, and the certification, then they learn a lot more than the basics. Predominantly, most of our courses are focused on structure, and then secondarily to that becomes the artistic end. Particularly as we get into the advanced courses, once you've mastered the structural knowledge, then we start getting into a lot more of the artistic side of things or the techniques that can be applied to more sculptural features. So how does stone fit into the larger environmental issues? Well, one of the great things with dry stone work is that it can have a very low carbon footprint. So if you're comparing it to a concrete wall, concrete's actually quite high in its CO2 use um, to make it and to truck it and to use it. And if you're able to use local stone, there's minimal, minimal um, environmental impact with um, the stone work itself. Also with dry stone work, all of the little cavities and crevices in the, in the work that you're doing is great for a wide variety of wildlife to live in. So a runner, uh, another term for it is stretcher, uh, is a stone that is set with its length along the face of the wall. Okay, so in a cheek end, you have headers and runners or headers and stretchers. Sometimes those stones will end up being one over three. Preferably not, but if they happen to be really long and you have no other way to use them, then that might be a good choice. And not every chicken that you come to is going to have really long rocks in it. It, it. it all depends on what you encounter. So you have to be able to work with whatever you come across to the best of your ability. My name is Nick Howe, and um, I live in Northampton, Massachusetts. So how did you hear about the Stone Trust? Well, I found them through a web search. I, was, I had a little stone project that I wanted to do in my backyard, and 
realized I didn't know very much about it, and so I was searching for resources on how to build with stone, and I came across the Stone Trust and you know, saw that they offered workshops, and so I signed up for this one. My wife observed that I, I love playing with stone, and I love you know getting dirty and building stuff. I think I have ever since I was a little kid, and so some of this is fulfilling a little bit of a childhood dream sort of thing, uh, more than a practical thing. You know, I, I think it's a great opportunity. I mean, I you know you could you could do uh, try to do it on your own and and maybe throw up something, but it might not it might not last. I mean, by taking the workshop, hey, it was a lot of fun. You know, meeting other people and hearing hearing the stories. Uh, that they have to tell, but you know, I also feel like having had a chance to build this, you know, with supervision from someone who knows what they're doing, uh, has given me the confidence that I could do it myself and do it the right way on my own projects. And hopefully someday you'll get that opportunity. I absolutely hope so. What do you hope your students take away from these? workshops? Number one, they should, they should develop an ethos around dry stone walling. They should become proficient uh, in the methodical application of the techniques that we teach. It should become second nature to them. That's, that's the important piece. An attitude of respect for both the material that they're working with and the community that they're working in, both on a human level and beyond that. If somebody's building a dry stone wall somewhere, they should be considering, hopefully, uh, not just the fact that they're building the dry stone wall, but where they're building the dry stone wall and what impact it's having. So we try to encourage people to have an awareness of uh, what they're doing and, and the environmental cost. My name is Alex Ward. I own New England Stone Walls and I'm from Spencer, Massachusetts. How did you learn about Stone Trust? My wife actually found it for me. I'm from New England originally, moved out west, lived in Wyoming for 22 years. You know, I told my wife that if I could ever make a living out of building stone walls, I would, because I've always had a passion for them, uh, loved working with the stones. So when we moved out here, she knew I didn't like the job that I was doing. I remembered what I'd said, and she started just looking stuff up and found the Stone Trust. She said, think you should do it. Started your own business? Yes. Do you hope to be certified by, at the Stone Trust? Yes. I'm uh, level one certified. I like to get my level two. After that, become an instructor and then uh, just you know, continue on. There's very much a tradition that goes into it. If you're putting in a runner and you know that your runner is 30 inches long, as you're laying the, the course below it, being very mindful that 30 inches in, you don't have a joint such that you're creating a running joint for the second course. And so as you're putting a course, into your, into your foundation or your face stones on either side, you should already have in mind what the cheek end stones that are gonna be placed on top, what the dimensions are, such that it will interact properly with the course that you're currently laying. So I'm Seth Harris. I am uh, advanced level certified waller through the Dry Stone Walling Association of Great Britain. I'm also a certified instructor here with the, the Stone Trust. What would you say to somebody that might be listening and they were interested in stonework, what they might find here that they might not find anywhere else? You know, the, the Stone Trust is great because it, it's dedicated to imparting knowledge and skill. There's this huge amount of knowledge, embodied knowledge, in people. So there's more to know about building a stone wall than somebody might assume. Yeah. Yes, there's there's a lot to know about it and every every region's stone is different. Each region's style is different. Each waller has a a, a series of decisions they make when they have an issue that they're trying to resolve. For me, not only just being part of the stone trust and 
having the connections with all of these different people and then working with different people. I've worked with so many different wallers over the years and every time you learn something from you know different methods of dealing with a, a particular issue there, there's nothing nothing more natural than than stone it just it is it's part of your environment and so by picking it up taking it organizing it you're creating this connection you know in, in a perfect world you could shave off an inch off that top yeah. to reflect that batter. And then putting these in an L configuration would would match them up perfectly. So it's okay to L debate. Oh yeah. Okay. Yep. So, it, so with every L, it alternates, but has a header in between. That's what I mean. Uh, not necessarily. You can L the whole way up. Sarah Bourne from Dover, Vermont. All right. So how did you learn about the Stone Trust? Uh, it, I live fairly locally, so I've been to events here before, admired the work, stone work here. So uh, I've been thinking about taking a class for several years. I've always admired stone walls, and my dad, you know, did some stone work and always pointed out walls to us when we were driving around Sunday afternoons with the family. I've always had an appreciation of stone, and I'm looking for something to do when I retire. Hopefully have a little hobby doing some stone work. I've already learned a lot, and uh, I never understood the reason for the coping on the top standing up like that. I always thought it was just decorative, but now I, I understand that it's integral part of the, the stone wall holding it together. You know, believe it or not, when you're walling and you get to a certain height and you're going from side to side and you're tapping a stone in, you'll bump the one on the other side and it mm -hmm. touches the string. So you just constantly have to kind of keep a look. Mm -hmm. It's something that you get used to. It's time. Mm -hmm. So everybody go put their strings up and we'll help you. I'm uh, Sam Brakely. I run a company called Hermit Woods Trail Builders. We do a lot of stone work in the woods on trails. Since becoming interested in that, I started moving towards um, interest in a little bit more formalized walling. So I started getting involved in the Stone Trust to do a little bit more formalized wall work and a little bit more in the front country, less in the woods and more residential. First class with the Stone Trust um, as a student was probably 10 years ago. I've been an instructor for three years now here. So as an instructor, what do you hope to teach your students? And what do you hope that they take away from? Uh, you know, I think above all, just a, a love and appreciation of working with stone. To me, it's such a, a beautiful medium. I enjoy teaching the mechanics and the, the detailed aspects of it. I think that's valuable, but most important to me is uh, just sharing a, a passion for stone and, and an excitement about what, what can be done with it. You know, certainly it, it connects me with nature. I think almost as important for me um, it connects me to, to a sense of place. So many walls that we build uh, are rebuilds. Um, you, you know, often we're working on field walls, often we're working on, I don't know, collapsed retaining walls or foundations or, or whatever the case may be. And um, working with something that I, you know, it's the same material that uh, whomever built it the first time, perhaps built it 50, 100, you know, perhaps longer ago. Um, feeling that connection to the history of a place, the, the history of of what was there before and the, the people who were there before, I think is really exciting for me. I love tearing apart an old wall uh, and seeing you know, what's in it. Often it's, it's trash or refuse, um, but it's not you know, Bud Light cans. It's uh, old pieces of farming equipment or you know, scraps of metal or it's um, pieces of a, of a former life that, that took place on that land. And I, I think I really like the, the connection I feel uh, to the people who were there before me. There are four levels of certification. Again, it's a certification scheme that comes out of the Dry Stone Walling Association of Great Britain, uh, which is the global certification entity. Level one certification requires a test that 
allows you to demonstrate that you have internalized and can apply the five basic principles of building a double-faced dry stone wall. Typically, it requires about five days of practice building using those principles, and we offer a five-day contractors intensive that allows people to become certified on day five. They take the test. Level two certification is a big, big step from level one. Level two certification focuses on building the wall end. So a wall in this tradition has two faces which lean in toward each other at a slight angle to counter the force of gravity. And then it has a vertical wall end, which is built according to the same principles, but it has a different structure. It has to hold the wall straight. It ha it's like bookends. That is a very, very challenging part of a wall to build. And the expectation of its fit and finish is much, much higher than the level one. So typically, people who have practiced building uh, and and then built at least 10 of these cheek ends, often working with people who have greater experience, are able to pass level two. Very often they don't pass it the first time. It really takes a lot of practice. Why people want level two certification is because that's the level that's considered professional. That's the level where you can feel confident that you can sell your services and that people can feel confident that they're buying a service that, that is reliable. Level three is advanced certification. That's several years out beyond that. It's a two-part test. So we don't have a lot of level three certified people. And I would say at this point, what you're talking about is people who are doing this really for the preservation of the craft and to appreciate the artistry of the craft. These are people really who love to work and create in stone. The level four test is a master craftsman test. Again, it has to do with building features, including a wall that's built on a 30 degree angle down a slope. Tomorrow, there will be 11 people there taking a test. I don't know why that should choke me up, but it does. By taking their test, they are preserving the craft. Mm -hmm. They are assuring that they have mastered the craft to X level. And there will be six of them at level one, and most of them will go on to level two. There will be five of them at level two, and some of them will go on to level three. So in order to preserve the art and the craft, it takes people to know it, and then to prove that they know it, and to advance through it. And that's what we want at the Stone Trust. If you want to come and take a class and go home and restore your walls, that's great. If you want to join us and continue on through the certification pathway and see about being a teacher and work with us about how to build and maintain stonework where you live, that's great. Whatever way you want to do it, we want to work with you. Kim Coggin, when I first moved to Pennsylvania 12, 13 years ago, I asked my children to get me some stone for Mother's Day. I wanted to build a small standing, freestanding wall around my house. And when I attempted it, it just didn't look like what I saw on TV or the magazines. So I looked on the uh, websites and internet and I found a stone trust. And I come up here and started taking classes. And I fell in love with it. And then the more in depth I got, I said, gosh, I'd like to be an instructor. You know, I like it that much. When we was doing our very first workshop, I was talking to Jared Flynn and Dan Snow's wife, Ellen Snow. Ellen was talking. She said, you know, it would be awesome if you guys would do a women's only. Jared said, you know what? That's a great idea. Let's do that. 
I was asked to be an instructor. As a woman stonemason, how do you f see things changing? As it, women are getting more and more into it. They really are. Either you a hobbyist or someone that wants to get uh, a job as a landscaper. A lot of them are landscapers and they want to really develop in their skills. And like yesterday, well, I had four landscapers come in and they said, we just want to beat the guys. And they, they did. They take it serious. It is a man's dominant field, but I see more in women of all ages, even in their 70s and 80s. I mean, they leave here empowered and, you know, they are confident. And they know things that a lot of their co-workers at the landscape place don't know. And they can argue that fact. They can argue it now. Yesterday we had a young woman that came here. 15 years ago, she wanted to learn the, the craft. She found a mason that was nearby. She went and talked to the mason, and she said, could you teach me, you know, the ins and outs? Or, you know, just show me just a little bit. And they laughed at her, and she didn't touch the stone since then. She saw that we had women's workshop out here, and she decided to come and give it a shot because she knew we wouldn't lie. And she said, I hadn't, I, I hadn't touched a stone for 15 years because I had been shunned. And, and I said, well, that's beautiful, you know, that you can come here. You'll be empowered when you leave. So what does the future look like for the Stone Trust? The future of the Stone Trust looks like endless possibility. There are people all over North America who want to learn how to build with dry stone. At present, we have our center in Vermont. We have training sites in New Hampshire and in Minnesota and in Pennsylvania and in Tennessee. The New Hampshire one is the most developed of those four. The big thing that's different now is that we are looking ahead to building the infrastructure at each site. So we're looking at what is the rate of infrastructure that can be built at each of those sites. And what does that make possible for people coming to learn at those sites? There's a tremendous interest in getting our capacity to teach out in the West and on the West Coast more developed. That's probably a multi-year experience. We've talked about the importance of making the knowledge of Stonecraft available to people in many places and to many kinds of people. And that is a really, really key aspect of the Stone Trust vision. So we are actively working to fund people who want to learn how to do stonework and to make their livelihoods from it. And we have recently provided six scholarships, four to women and two to men, in order to have them pursue their career pathway. I think that's really critical to learn this craft. Um, so you're just not doing this to teach people you're really doing this to promote the craft forward into the future. We have to. Yeah. Our mission is to preserve the craft. You can't preserve the craft unless it has real life in real communities. Right, it has relevance. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just about building beautiful stone walls. Right. It's about a functional living artifact, as in archaeology. Everything that you find in archaeology was part of a society. It was a useful piece of the society that had value. And so, no, building the stone trust and building the stone walls is not extraneous. It's embedded in the society and in the economy wherever we're working. If you want to learn more, about the Stone Trust and the many workshops that they have to offer, please visit thestonetrust.org. I would like to thank everyone 
who was involved for sharing their time and their thoughts. The future of stone looks good. Also, I would like to thank my sister Maureen for her generous contribution to Nature Revisited and for making this episode possible. The music is by Ben Cosgrove from his latest album, The Trouble with Wilderness. If you enjoyed this episode, please share with family, friends, and colleagues. You can always subscribe to Nature Revisited on your favorite podcast server. You can also follow us on Instagram, YouTube, or on our website, nordenproductions.com. That's Norden, N-O-O-R-D-E-N, productions.com. If you would like to share your thoughts or comments, please send them to us on our website, and we will share them on our Instagram page. Nature Revisited is produced by Stefan Van Orden and Charles Kagan. I hope you will join us for the next edition of Nature Revisited. And in the meantime, remember, we are nature.